There's a cat over here. There's a cat over there. And the wrong one died. And the wrong one died. Welcome to The Wrong Cat Died, the podcast breakdown of the cat catastrophe. I'm your host, Mike Abrams, and today we have a, a amazing fan guest. Uh, she has a bunch of art and cat stalls and has been doing fan writing and all kinds of stuff since the 80s when she's become a fan of the show. She wrote me a dissertation email on how Old Deuteronomy's criteria is defined in the lyrics, so I figured we had to talk through this and all kinds of other stuff. So welcome, Jen Ancorn, and thank you for joining me. Thank you for having me. I'm really excited to do this. I um, your email kind of blew me away when I read it because I just wasn't <laughs> expecting to get an email with such like a thoughtful note on a question I've been asking a lot. So I do want to get to that towards the end though because I does I think that's going to relay into your answer about Grisabella. Um, but let's start at the beginning with your history of the show. I know you said that you became a history or you became a fan of the show in the '80s in New Zealand from the from a cassette tape. Like when did you learn about the show? Yeah, that's right. My parents actually got their cassette tape. It must have been around 1984. Um, and I just kind of became obsessed with it. I would have been like six years old, um, didn't understand it at all. I mean, you guys kind of talk about not really understanding the show when you go and see it. But if you can imagine this little kid in sort of New Zealand who doesn't have any context for this at all, trying to figure out what it's about from a cassette tape, that was kind of my mission when I was a kid. It was, um, it just kind of sounded kind of spooky to me. You start with those weird synthesizer noises and then the lyrics are really difficult to understand, I think, as maybe as an adult, but as a kid, there's all these words I've never heard before, all these strange names. And I just would listen to it over and over and over again. It was all I wanted to listen to. And I had a little cassette player I got for my birthday. And after that, I was just basically in my room listening to this cassette tape, <laughs> trying to figure out what it could possibly be about. I So it's an interesting thing that you bring that up because I have, there's. it seems like there's a, a group of people that will see or listen to every cast album before they see a show. And there's some people that won't do it. It's like, if I'm gonna go see it, I don't wanna hear anything. I wanna be surprised in the moment. Yeah. And so you kind of just like point through it. What is that experience, now having seen the show, what's that experience like knowing? Cause it is such a vis visual show that it's kind of hard with just the cassette tape. <laughs> yeah, because you don't really know who any of the... I mean, there's the list of names and naming, obviously, but you don't know which cat is singing which bit. And, and I wasn't really even sure if they were cats because um, the cassette had a little inlay and there was one picture in it. I think it was of Mungo and Rump. Mm -hmm. But those early... This was the, the London, the original London cast, and those early costumes, they were kind of more impressionistic. So, like, the female cats would have their hair up in pigtails to sort of signify ears, and the makeup was quite basic. Basic, and the costumes just kind of gave a suggestion of cats. So I was looking at these this tiny black and white grainy photo of these two people. I was like, well, are these the cats? Are the cats and people in this show? Because <laughs> a lot of the songs are in third person as well. So you, I wasn't sure if these were people singing about cats. And then, you know, they're based on T.S. Eliot poems, which mm -hmm. are kind of, it's sort of satirizing London in the 1930s, which has a six-year-old in 80s New Zealand, I had no way of understanding. Yeah. Yeah. So I kind of understood it, but in this weird, it was kind of like a cargo cult. It was like getting messages from this little world that existed, and I was just trying to figure it out. Yeah, I. it is... It is like a little, it's kind of dated at some point, you know, too, because it's like the poems are, are old and yeah. they're definitely British. And then it's become a, you know, an international show. And so I, I do kind of think it's kind of, I, I can't even fathom being that young and just hearing just the cassette tape, having seen, you know, had the reverse experience. I saw the visual mm. as an adult, as the first introduction besides memory. You know, I think everyone knew memory at some, at <laughs> yeah. some point. Um, and I had the, you know, the reverse of like, wow, what did I see? And I think, you know, in your email, you also told me that you do think children, it kind of goes over their heads. I agree with that. I think it's that middle teenager that it's like, oh, that's probably a little, a little strange, but yeah. it did kind of, it, the, especially the lyrics aren't going to really strike much, but when did you first see it? Cause you said that you saw a tour. 
That's well, actually, my friend in New Zealand, she was also a huge Cats fan, and she got um, her dad worked for TV New Zealand. So when the Australia tour came to New Zealand, they did one show there, I think, in Auckland. And obviously, that was still when Cats was like the mega show that yeah. really hard to get tickets for. So I didn't get to go, but my friend did, and she got the program. And then we had a little bit more information because we could look at color pictures in the program. And she was an amazing dancer and gymnast, so she would try and act out what she remembered. Um, but I still kind of didn't really have any idea of the show. Um, and then in 91, me and my family moved back to the UK. My parents are British. And pretty much the first thing we did when we got there, my mom took me to London to see the actual show. And that was when, you know, the, the curtains were open, the sort of like mystery was... I don't want to say the mystery ended because, you know, it's cats, but yeah. I actually got to see <laughs> the show that had been sort of like seared into my brain for, for a decade. You know, it's it's kind of I, thinking about this from like I grew up in the same era and time and I'm, I'm hearing all this going like, oh, yeah, of course, like you don't know any of this stuff. And it's so different than today. Whereas like when I started this, it's the Internet age. And the only reason I agreed to this originally is when I first got asked about the show, I said, well, let me see what I can find on the Internet. And you don't have all that at the no. time you're going through this. Like you're, you've got, you're like having clues being pieced together, a little piece by piece that you get as you learn more because there's not this 5,000 page Wikipedia fandom page <laughs> that exists to tell you every nuance of the show that you need and all these theories. And so it's so interesting to hear you say it that it's like, okay, I start with the cassette tape. Then I got a program. I learned just a little bit more. Then I finally got to see it, but you don't have any video. You know, there's no YouTube clips of it. No. So it's whatever your experience was that one time. Yeah, it's kind of what you can remember from the show. And, you know, there's no, yeah, like you said, there's no 98 version. You can't watch it over and over again. And there's no real, I mean, there are other fans because it's cats. So, um, but there's no way to talk to them because, you know, this is before the internet, before we have a computer. And also starting off in New Zealand, like I suppose if you left somewhere like New York, you would see commercials for it a lot. Um, yeah. That's kind of the experience they get from other fans. But, you know, New Zealand, we had two TV stations. They weren't showing <laughs> commercials for cats. They weren't showing much of anything. So it really was just completely cut off from the phenomenon. Yeah, I mean, I'm from Indiana, so we weren't getting those commercials either. <laughs> yeah. um, it is, yeah, and I don't remember the tours that came through. Like, there was, you know, by the time I was, I don't know, teenage age, it was in regional productions. It was big enough to be, you know, had been on Broadway long enough that it was it was around. But I, you had to be a you know deep theater fan, in my opinion, to have noticed it because I I yeah. didn't. It went right over my head. I was busy playing hockey. Um, <laughs> So you saw, okay, so you saw uh, the London production. Was this West End or was this tour? Yeah, this was the West End. This was um, the original production at the New London Theatre, which, I mean, I love the tours. I think they're fantastic. The people who work on them are great. But to see it for the first time in a theatre that has been purposefully built for cats. Yeah. Because, uh, you know, the New London <laughs> was kind of like a rundown space and they basically gutted it and rebuilt it to build cats into it. And also, it's kind of like an arty kid, um, the stage design, and just, you kind of like, it's it's not in a really nice place of London. It's not one of those grand old mm. theatres that, you know, you see the outside and you're like, oh, I'm at the theatre, this is already great. It's kind of this boring, square, concrete building. And then you go inside and you're kind of in a different world. And kind of that's what I love about the theatre. And I think having that as my first musical experience, I mean, it just blew my mind just walking into that space and seeing that set it was it was more amazing than i could have hoped it would be that's awesome yeah i mean it's the the whole design of the junkyard is is insane to see the first time so it's cool to see it in a place kind of built for it um, yeah they the john napier design is something i've always really loved about the show he did you know the costumes and the set mm -hmm. and just the way they incorporated like the junk wasn't just generic junk it was you know brands that you recognize it was like you'd walked in off the street and been shrunk down and you were in this little cat's world and just to be transported straight away because I, I think the thing about cats i find is that you have to come to meet it it's not going to hold your hand and sort of take you through mm -hmm. the show you have to let yourself be put in that world before you're going to be able to enjoy it and i think the set goes a long way towards doing that yeah i remember when i saw the 98 movie the first time i saw a clark's shoebox as like <laughs> yeah. part of it and i was like that's such a classically 
um, you know, British, you know, English company, and they're building it into. I think if someone was wearing it as like a hat, and so that's it, right. One of the dogs doesn't the yeah, yeah. yeah. So I, I thought that was you know it's so clever, so smart. Um, how many times have you seen the show now? Like how many? Forgetting the movie, like live. <laughs> what, what's your count to live? Um, okay, so I am an artist. I think there's two kinds of artists. There's like the rich parents artist where you kind of have lots of money you don't have to get a real job and then there's the <laughs> makes poor life decisions artist and i'm the second one so i don't have enough money to see shows a lot um so unfortunately i have seen it live three times awesome and i would love to go and see it more but only three times I, you've got me be i've seen it twice so it's, okay. it's hard it's hard to you know it's hard to see i mean it's beyond the cost it's just you know now it's only touring or you got to be in a yeah. place where it is um so yeah i know it's it's uh it's accessibility is a, a never ending conversation with with Broadway is, for sure. Yeah. I mean, that's kind of why I love that people do bootlegs and put them on YouTube. Yeah. I think, you know, they provide such a service to the, the theater community and the fandom community. Um, so God bless them. Um, but yeah, I saw the next time I saw it after that initial show in the UK was um, I moved to America. My husband's an American. And my big idea, just we'd f just gotten married. Um, we've been together, like, living in America a month. And I was like, oh, Cats is in Boston, where I live. I'm going to yeah. take my husband to Cats, and he's going to love it. Um, <laughs> and did it that did work not out? Go that well. no. <laughs> 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 I think my first mistake was, um, we, like I said, we'd been married a month, so I was still making, like, the grand romantic gesture. So I was like, I'm going to book, you know, front row, aisle seat. He's going to love it. And I think we'd like the lights go down, green eye starts, and a cat sits in his lap and he is out. Yeah. That is. <laughs> He's instantly terrified. If you are, that is another theater thing. You either like to be involved from the beginning or you just want to be a spectator. I'm the spectator type. I was very glad <laughs> I was not on the aisle because I, I was yeah. still terrified when that green eye started. Um, <laughs> and so, yeah, I think that's a, you got to know, got to know your audience. I, I did see a show recently and it was a, an improv show and we had four seats on the aisle and I'm like, I'm going the fourth seat in. Oh no. Yeah. I was like, I'm going to be the fourth seat in. You all can sit on the aisle. I don't want to have <laughs> any chance of being pulled up on this show. Yeah. And I'm usually like that too. I really sympathize with him because any show but cats, that would be me too. <laughs> yeah. I want to hear a little bit. You, you emailed me. We, we talked a little bit about some of the stuff that you and your fandom and there's one that I, I did a little bit of checking out, but it's not as active. So I want to hear the history. Um, you did some writing um, as a writer and an artist for, I think you said it was called Live Journal and MusicNet Fan Spaces. So yeah. what are what are these? Tell me about them. So I think before Tumblr was the space, like Live Journal, it's so funny having to explain what Live Journal is <laughs> yeah. because it was so ubiquitous. <laughs> um, yeah, Live Journal was a, you know, a place where people would have blogs, but there were also themed communities and sort of that was my cat's fandom space. So that was... Life Journal tended to be more talking sort of about various different productions and sort of theories, kind of what you talk about theories of, you know, what the backstory to different characters were, sort of technical details of the show. That was kind of my fandom space. Um, Musicals.net was a message board, sort of various different musicals, and all the Andrew Lloyd Webber fans kind of had their own little board because nobody else, Andrew yeah. Lloyd Webber, desperately unfashionable by that point, and sort of cats even more so. So we had our own little space that we wouldn't venture out of. Or again, you sort of talk about the technical side of the musicals, the backstory a bit. And then the two other big communities were like the role play and fan fiction community, which mm -hmm. I wasn't really a part of, and the costuming community. And they had a board called um, Cat's Costume Discussion Board, which I would occasionally go on, but I was not a costumer. I have never looked good in light crew. <laughs> I wasn't going to be there. <laughs> yeah, the cosplay, there is still a strong community. There's a couple of people that make, amazing. That make yeah. like, these incredibly detailed um, costumes that people are wearing. And... Uh, I hadn't so and I, there's also now the like fan Wikipedia page which yeah. has which is where I think a lot of the stuff on that pulls from those threads because it's yeah. just an aggregate of it all it's not like anything new and I was looking at the musicals.net um, today just out of curiosity to see what's still there it looks like it was built in 1999 it looks like it hasn't been updated <laughs> since 1999 yeah there are four posts from 2022 so there is one person still going strong on the cats page there trying yeah. to go but i think you said a lot of the like theories came from that so was this like a 
was this kind of like what I'm doing on the podcast, essentially, which is talking to each other of like, when I saw it, these two were standing next to each other. So this is my assumption. Or like, how detailed was it? Because some of this probably dates, not the internet, but but you weren't able to see it very frequently. It was probably dates mm-hmm. YouTube and all the other stuff of where you'd have different bootleg, you know, the TikTok, Instagram, quick versions of it. Yeah, that's right. I think okay. Live Journal was, you know, mainly the place where that happened. And also, this was around the time the 98 movie had just come out. So I think that was the basis for most of the early Cats fan theories. Because before then, as you said, it was just, you know, what show you happen to see. And, and it's really hard to concentrate on what one particular cat is yeah. doing if you're just seeing, like, this one show. So I think most of the early fan theories did come from the 98 movie. And then it would just be, there was, I think, there was a, a London tour going on at the time. And I know a lot of the regular posters followed the tour around England and they would sort of drop in little bits that they'd seen in the tour. So it was, it was again, it was more guesswork. But I think most of the early fan theories, and I think certainly Tugger Misto came from the 98 version. It was all just this was the only cats we could watch over and over. So this was where they, the early sort of like relationship theories. Yeah. Came from. So is, is tug off was that birthed in these, these I forums? think it was. I'm probably going to get a hundred people saying that I'm wrong now, but I think that it was, it was all from the video because there's a lot of scenes in that video. Obviously there is in the, the musical too, mm-hmm. but just the way it's cut, um, I think it came from that. And a lot of other, Fan theories, I think it's interesting, I said to you in my email, that each sort of generation of cat fans seems to have their own particular theories and their own particular relationships. And people my age, most of them came from the 98 movie. And I think now there's a touring cast with sort of like a young cast. We're seeing all these new sort of family relationships and, and you know, romantic relations coming up. And it's kind of interesting that there's these different generations. Yeah, it, you know, I think some of that has to do with the thing I've been saying recently, and I, I firmly believe, is Cats feels like telephone, like the game of telephone, which is the original group isn't necessarily giving the full message, but you've got somebody who got it from, you know, Joey Lynn, Chris Cartwright, like, you know, Trevor Nunn. Like, you got the stories from that group who's now passing yeah. it along, and you've got the Jacob Brents of the world who are giving more information, but it keeps going a couple of generations down. And yeah. I, and I wonder how much it's not getting lost in translation, but like, I don't think it's, I don't think most of the stuff is like truly documented in the sense mm-hmm. of like, I don't think there's a book, like there's not a, every cast gets this book and it's all the backstories. I feel like it's a, you know, a, a couple, I think it's a day or two that they used to sit around and each person got their story, but not all the other stuff they had to fill in the blanks. And that's kind of what, you know, I'm slowly documenting over time as much as I can from what people remember. And I don't think there is any right or wrong because, you know, it is kind of up to interpretation. That's one of the great things about the show. And I think it's really interesting how sort of fan theories are informing um, younger casts. Because, I mean, if you look at sort of like, the classics sort of like Tyler Haynes using the the fan art um, yeah. to kind of inspire his on stage role is is kind of crazy to me that all that sort of like nerdy stuff we were talking about in the nineties could actually go on to inspire casts these days. Yeah, I mean, there's just there's too much information in the world now that like <laughs> yes. they it went from just being whatever you got told in rehearsals to maybe someone stopped you at the stage door to now getting tagged in every post that someone draws or and yeah. everything that comes with it. And so it is such a unique and different world where they have that. I mean, even I've talked to cast members who have said they, they listened to other of, of my podcast of other people that played their particular character to hear how they went, thought about it, just to hear other versions of it. So it's like, it is a, what can you learn? Because there's so much source material for, for this show now. Exactly. And I think that's a really nice thing. I think some people get very defensive about their pet sort of like theories, but I'm going to try very hard not to do that later on. Okay. <laughs> but well, I, I think one of the good things is that, you know, I don't think anyone can be wrong about cats. <laughs> I well, I want to get into it. And I think this is probably the great place to do that. I want to start actually with before we go into all your theories and I want to hear them all. I want to hear <laughs> first, though, you mentioned something I think is super interesting that that your email actually sparked me to think a little bit more about is that the generations have their own pieces. So I would love to hear which generation changes do you think of where it's like the older generation thinks this is true and the younger generation thinks this is true it tends to be more sort of like the the fan theory stuff because i know 
sort of, I guess, my contemporaries on the internet, like it was absolutely received wisdom that Grizabella is the mother of Demeter and Bombell Urena. If you said that wasn't true, everybody would shout you down because that was just how it was. And that all comes from, you know, Elaine Page and the video being much older than, well, I don't mm-hmm. want to say much older, sorry, yeah. Elaine, yeah. a little bit older <laughs> than some of um, some of the other cast members. Um and then I think if you look at people now, Grizabella is, you know, they've changed her costume and they've usually cast, you know, a, a younger actress. And now the theory is that she's a contemporary of Bomb and mm-hmm. Demeter. So it's, it's kind of little things like that, I think. Yeah. I mean, I mean, there's, it's a lot of this stems from who you cast. Um, yeah. Because I do think even Jenny, like in 2016, the Jenny any that's were young or super young. Yeah. And it's supposed to be a very motherly, older role usually, or at least that's the way it reads. And so they had to even in that way kind of transition a little bit of that. Yeah, I think Jenny and Je- especially Jelly Lauren, they had Susan Jane Turner, who was like one of the original London cast playing her in the 98. So she was like the grandma cat in, in, in our kind of version of the fandom. And now they do tend to cast a young, you know, and, and it's just a completely different interpretation of the character just based on what is the main cats that you see. Mm-hmm. I hope you're having a jellical ball. We'll be right back after this quick break. All right, let's, it's time for your theories. Which ones are you going to go adamantly defend? Like, what's your, what's what's the stuff that you're bringing back from the mu- musicals and live journal, musicals.net and live journal? Like, what do, I, what do I need to know? Well, I mean, my main theory, it's not really a theory so much as like um, a truth. I'm going to say a truth. truth. Um, Monka Strap is the best cat. <laughs> okay. I think Monka Strap gets really short shrift. And I think he kind of, not in the fandom because he's such a favorite, but I think when you go and see the show, his costume out, stands out a little bit, but he doesn't get his own number. And I think most casual cats, people who just go and see it once, they're not really going to remember who he is. But um, for me, he's such he holds the show together. He's the narrator and kind of my theory about his place in the tribe. So you have, you know, old Deuteronomy, the leader, but he's not there most of the time. Um, they meet once a year. And if you listen to the lyrics of Old Deuteronomy, he kind of lives in a, in a village. They talk about him sitting in the high street and holding up the cattle on market day. So he's off out in the village kind of meditating or whatever it is he does. My theory is that Monkestrap is the one who lives in London and he's kind of the, the problem solver, the big brother. Like if any of the cats have a problem, they can go and find Monkestrap and he's going to help them. And I kind of think he's my favorite character because I'm the oldest of four kids. <laughs> and I have a lot of sympathy with like the older brother. He has these two. He has Tugger, who's Tugger, kind of like yeah. off doing his own thing, has no responsibility, lives this wild lifestyle. And then he has McCavity, who's the bad guy, and kind of like the evil brother, who's also doing his own thing. So he's kind of. I think you can play him as the dutiful, sort of boring, sort of type A, everybody has to do what I say, cat. But my favorite portrayal of him is just like this caring brother who wouldn't push himself into that role. He doesn't, he's not sort of like ambitious. He doesn't want to be the next old Deuteronomy, but since both of his brothers kind of can't be bothered to show up, that's what he has to do. It's like a dutiful role. It's it's so interesting to hear you say this. So there's two things I think that it's kind of fun to he- like hearing this. One is is you're spot on that as a casual fan, I did ten episodes where I picked the ten cats that I thought were most important, and he was the eleventh one I did. <laughs> and it was it wasn't until after I started like really researching, I'm like, oh, he's got a more role because I did the songs. I picked the songs, and he doesn't yeah. have one. So you definitely are right there. This is uh, this analogy is going to lose everybody who listens to this podcast. But what I'm hearing is. It's like when, when you have a head coach, in some cases you get a head coach in sports who is very like tough and, you know, very, he's, he's kind of, you know, the drill sergeant and the assistant coach is really the one that keeps the team together. That's the one that the players go to and everything. And that's Monk. You just describe that relationship yeah. and it gets shown in a lot of movies too, like Miracle and stuff like that, where head coach is really tough. That's old Deuteronomy. And then this is the person that's really keeping everybody together. And so I think that's a, an interesting way to look at it, as that is the best character. But I hadn't thought about him not being ambitious, because I had, everything I'd read or f- had felt is that he wants to be the one in charge, not that he feels like he needs to because there's no other choice. So that's kind of interesting think, to hear. 
Yeah, and I don't. I think his three words, none of them are dutiful. But you know, if I was recasting cats, that would be one of his words is dutiful mm-hmm. because there really isn't anybody who could stand in that space, and he kind of has to do it. And I, my theory is that his resentment of Tiger earlier in the show is because that's who he would love to be. He'd love to be off uh. just like flirting, and he's there to party, and he's having an amazing time. But you know, he can't because if he doesn't do it, who's going to do it? Yeah. That's in, that is interesting because I I interpreted it a little bit more of like I want to and I'm annoyed that my brother is going to have the free time because he's ruining what I want to do, <laughs> ruining my chance to take over. But when does his time come? Do you have a thought on that? I kind of see. I think uh, you know eventually Deuteronomy is going to die. He's going to disappear, and then Michael Strap will step up. But I don't think he will do it in an ambitious way. I think he will do it because. He's kind of, he's been pushed into that role since he was, you know, a young cat and now it's his time. He's going to sort of stand up and do his duty. I think dutiful is, like I said, is the word I would use for him. Mm -hmm. He doesn't seem like kind of, I think McCavity is like the ambitious one who would maybe try and take over, but Munkerstrap's not really that cat. Yeah. Okay. I I see it. I definitely see it. Um, What other theories do you have? Like, what other theories? I also like asking this question, although you just you you started this conversation by saying you're not going to (laughs) get defensive about him. But what do what have I gotten wrong? Like, where am I like very clearly wrong on stuff? (laughs) Um, uh, Yeah, I mean, you can get defensive. I think you're like. (laughs) buster for crim i love your buster for criminal theory i think it's fantastic i kind of prefer that but i don't think that's Buster. no no i think he's more kind of a bumbling sort of um so that was kind of one of the things that i when i was a kid i would listen to buster for jones's song and i was like okay i get it he likes to eat but it's listing all these obscure places in london i have i didn't even know they were in london i have no idea what they are and then when I got older and I read the Jeeves and Worcester books, I was like, oh, this is who Buster for Jones is. These are all gentlemen's clubs, which I know like you interpret as strip clubs, which I think is a fantastic interpretation. Yeah. I love that. But I think they're supposed to be like, you know, a club in London is if you were like a posh Etonian schoolboy, you would join a gentleman's club, which is basically a club for other rich men to yeah. get away from their wives and to hobnob and and kind of just enjoy being an upper class fancy man so he's kind of like this old sort of like stuffy kind of gourmand who doesn't really sort of i don't think he's really that involved with the tribe he just kind of turns up to say you know i'm here i'm off again i'm gonna eat lunch but i don't see him as a, a criminal mastermind which actually i liked your version so yeah, <laughs> i'm not I, you gonna know, argue with it i think this is where the um just like the the British English interpretation of it came. I read Gentleman's <laughs> Club as I was like reading about him and I'm like, that's, and this was when I was really up in arms about it being not for kids. And it's like, <laughs> I think I just learned that the ball was an orgy and all this stuff. And I'm like, now nah, he's got this, you know, this one guy going to Gentleman's Clubs. And, and it's like, yeah, Gentleman's Club has a very different term in, <laughs> in London than it is in the United States. And so it's like, yeah, I, I think I just filled in blanks. I also think like, it's kind of a boring cat. So I think I just tried yeah. to make him more exciting to myself of like, if we're going to deal and talk about him, if I'm going to write a, an episode for him, like let's make him more interesting. So that's where, well, I agree with you. No, that's somewhere I agree with you. I think uh, I don't want to say it's the worst song in cats, but it's my least favorite song in cats. Um, I think his costume tends to get a laugh and sort of like, if you, you usually have a great singer in that role so they can really sell it. But if I'm like, if I'm watching it sort of on YouTube, whatever, then that's the number I'll skip. Yeah, it is the number that gets cut in the Royal Caribbean 90 minute version. That's the first thing that gets cut. Yeah, I can't imagine a 90 minute version of Cats. <laughs> there is an, if you go, I, the Oasis of the Seas, I think it's still going. Um, they do Cats, I think, once or twice during the seven day cruise. If you are interested in going on a cruise yeah, I mean, and seeing yes, Cats. Obviously. I mean, I don't think I'm interested in going on it. I'd be the only person who went on the cruise specifically to see Cats. <laughs> that, that, that is part of the <laughs> challenge of doing that particular performance. What other theories, like, what other theories am I. Am I close on? Am I right on? What are like? What were the biggest theories that came out of your live journal? Um, I'm trying to think now. Let me see. Uh, I think another strange one, which no one really picks up on these days. This is kind of a, an obscure one and entirely based on the '98 version. Is um, Tiger Admetus? Because Admetus is such a minor character. I think in some versions he does the dance with Victoria. But um, I know in, if you watch the 98 version of Tugger, you have all the female cats dancing around him, plus Admetus. 
and Ed Meters is clearly having an amazing time and really enjoying himself and really into Tugger. So one of the main fan theories of the day was Tugger Ed Meters was a couple. I definitely did not pick that one up. Um, <laughs> that is, I wonder, do you know if that that's like still even relevant in 2016's version? Like, are they still like, is that more from the 98 movie? I think it was in the 98 movie. See, this was the thing that sort of like the fandom in those days hinged around that 98 yeah. movie because it was the only one that everybody could reliably see and had seen. So I don't even know if Ed Meters is in the 2016 version. I was going to say, version. I don't think that Ed Meters is. Because like, right when you said that, I'm like, which cat? Like who? I, I'm like not even positive. <laughs> like I, I remember the name, but I don't think He's they're... one of those, you have like um, pounceable car buttons. <laughs> Buckety Admetus, who I always get mixed up to. I'm a bad is it Alon- fan. Is it Alonzo? Like, maybe they renamed him. No, he's not Alonzo. He's okay. going, but I know in the 98 version, because they were trying to pull in as many sort of old cast members as possible, they put in a lot of cats who would sometimes be one cat combined. And But yeah, Admetus was strangely popular in the 90s. All right. Well, um, I want you to go. I'm, while you're giving me your next theory, I'm going to look up <laughs> if they were in 2016. <laughs> sure. It's just I'm curious if they're in 2016 or not. Um, and I think, yeah, guys, I say go with the next the next theory that I, that you think the the fans or that like came out of this that you definitely need to know. I think another one of the big theories which you don't really hear that much nowadays is um, Griddlebone was strangely popular, and I know um, they didn't even have that number in the 2016 revival. Nah, that was the Grail Tiger number. Yep, that was cut. Yeah, and I think a lot of people just loved her costume because she's barely in it. Um, so Griddlebone was sometimes um, Grizabella's mother, sometimes Demeter and Bomb's mother. And I think a, a big theory that went around because, you know, they're both white cats was um, Griddlebone is Victoria's mother. Griddlebone. Oh, okay. So that eliminates the Grizabella <laughs> question then. Of that, So that takes Grizabella yeah, from being not... Victoria's mother. See there, I don't really buy into the the Grizabella as Victoria's mother. I I think that, I think as well, like, I don't think you can assume all the cats in the junkyard are related. You know, probably some of them are, some of them aren't. I always see Victoria as kind of an outsider. And I know that Monka Strap as her father has become sort of like the accepted theory, which was one of those ones that I was like, oh, yeah, I can see that. But yeah, back, Mm. back in the day, Griddlebone featured heavily in a lot of these theories. And the funny thing is, I don't even know if she's a real cat because she only appears in the context of Gus telling about this pirate role he used to play on stage. So she's not necessarily even real. Yeah. Although I suppose she is mentioned in, in McCavity. They mentioned Griddlebone as being one of the, the evil cats. <laughs> yeah. And that's and they played it up in the, the newer movie um, for sure. Okay. I do have an Enmetus note. It's Plato. As well as the renamed. Oh yeah. So that was the difference as they renamed Admetus to Plato, um, because it's supposed to be part of McCavity's number and it was just an ensemble character. But to your point, in some productions did the Victoria dance. Yeah, that's right. And that kind of is one of the things I do like about the cats fandom is that you can see this one cat in the background who's in one specific production on this day because someone was sick and you'll have somebody who that becomes their favorite cat and they start spinning out all their stories and lore about them. And I find that really fun. (laughs) That is, yeah, I mean, that is a lot of this is that you see some, some one thing and then that becomes the, the, the theory behind something else. And it could just be one performance. You know, you just caught the one character that made a decision. The actor made one decision on one day. That fan is a big fan, caught it, wrote about it. And then it is like, Oh, well that could mean this. That could mean this. So I think yeah, a lot and of that then other people latch onto it and yeah. it becomes true. <laughs> and it becomes part of it. And then now the actors play into it. Exactly. Yeah. I love it. Um, let's do some rapid fire. Cause I want to get to the last question. Cause I know you have a very sure. thoughtful answer and I want, I want to hear the full explanation of it. Um, <laughs> so first of all, if you were in the show, who would you want to perform as? I mean, I ought to say Monkey Strap, yeah. but you know, I like Monkey Strap. I want to be Tugger. And I know it's a boring answer cause everyone wants to be Tugger, but I mean, like he's a bisexual rock star with an amazing coat. So like who would not want to be Tugger? <laughs> it is. It's fun. Cause there's a lot of people where it's like, I want to do something that's totally not me. Or there's a lot of people that are are just like, no, this is mine. I want to be this character. Because I think there's a lot of ways to answer that, which is what's fun. Um, Yeah. You've already, I I think I know your answer for favorite cat, but I also want to hear your (laughs) least favorite cat. 
Well, my favorite is obviously Monk. I think he's fantastic. Um, I think my my least favorite is going to be controversial. Um, uh, it's um, it's Jenny. Jenny. My namesake. <laughs> it's Jenny. I think only for the reason that she gives off major if you've got time to lean you've got time to clean vibes um <laughs> i i don't want a bossy cat sort of like sleeping all day hypocritical and then waking up and if i'm a mouse or a cockroach telling me i've got to be in a beetle's tattoo i've got to learn to knit and so i mean i don't i don't see them stopping her doing cat things so i think she should just leave those beetles and mice alone to just enjoy being beetles and mice i i find her very bossy and I know she's also Monka Strap's choice, so it's like a double betrayal, but uh, eh, I don't like Jenny. <laughs> okay, I love it. Just, yeah, just too bossy. Just leave us alone. Yeah. Let us live our lives. Too bossy. <laughs> Mind your own, but sleep, sleep all night as well. It's yeah. <laughs> What's your uh, favorite song from the show? Um, The Moments of Happiness, I think. Okay. Um, I mean, The Ball is fantastic. I love The Ball, but I think The Moments of happiness because you know as a little kid who liked spooky things and as yeah. a, a weird sort of goth teenager that song is so goth <laughs> yeah i love it um i which cat do you think would be the best like artist or doll i know you do doll making and stuff like that which which cat do you think would be best at that um i think probably you can make an argument that mr mistopheles like his magic is kind of like a allegory for an artist um he's the quiet cat he kind of keeps to himself he never says anything but occasionally he does something amazing and um and that kind of like is kind of an allegory for any kind of artist to me so i'd say mr mm, interesting i was thinking purely doll making and i went with your least favorite jenny because i figure if she's oh, teaching no. everyone to <laughs> crochet and do all this other it stuff probably she probably is, her, is. But- it probably is but in my defense my mom tried to teach me to knit like three times and uh, i <laughs> could couldn't do it. yeah <laughs> that's part of it that's why that's part of your animosity towards jenny i think you're right i think we figured <laughs> it out <laughs> all right i want to go to the the most important question you gave me a very i'm assuming your answer is grizabella is a joke choice based on your answer but you gave me a very thoughtful reason on how old Deuteronomy makes the decision so i'd love to for you to explain where this comes from, how you kind of got to this point. And then I'm going to see if I can poke any holes into your argument, which I, <laughs> I've thought about and it's hard because it's pretty sound. Yeah, well, so, I mean, I think Deuteronomy's like criteria is something you talk about a lot. And I think possibly he has a different criteria every year, but the year that we're seeing, he kind of explains his criteria during the moments of happiness. He sort of sees Grizabella having her sad moment, you know, singing Little Memory, and then he sits through the interval, sort of receiving these thought beams from the moon. Um, this is try- how I explain cats to people when I'm trying to get them to watch it and why they'll never <laughs> want to watch it. <laughs> um, and then when we come back after intermission, he sings a moment of happiness. It's kind of his mission statement. Um and the lyric is, if you find there the meaning of what happiness is, then a new life can begin. So his criteria for this year is you have to look back into your memories and figure out the meaning of happiness, which is a really big ask. It's like it's not great of old Deuteronomy to set this up as the, the task of the year, but I think the moments of happiness is the key to understanding cats. And it's tricky because the lyrics are very kind of opaque. They're sort of T. S. Eliot sort of going off mm-hmm. on one of his T. S. Eliot <laughs> sprees. But so here's my question to this, because this is this happens when she when she comes back, right? Like that's mm-hmm. where this comes. And I think to your point is he might have a different criteria every year what is his criteria if she doesn't come back like that i mean maybe this is this is obviously a very hypothetical scenario and a show that 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 doesn't come but if she doesn't return how is he making his decision this year because i do think like i i get your point where she returns and it's like oh here's here's i'm going to change my criteria and i'm going to tell you all that it's this this figuring out the memory and all this stuff through it but what if she doesn't come back see i think um this kind of like a cheat answer to your question which is one of the lyrics of moments of happiness is something that is probably quite ineffable so i could just be like oh that's ineffable (laughs) but then i think the non-cheating answer is he surrounds himself with psychic cats we have Coricapat and Tantamile, mm. who are a big part of that song, they kind of beam his thought directly to Jemima and when she sings. Um, and we have Cassandra, who can also see the future. So I think he knows she's going to come back. 
I think he kind of like sees the thread that runs through the Jellicle ball and and he knows kind of what her journey is and he knows that she has to be the choice. And sort of throughout the show, I think when she sings the first version of Memory, it's more about what she's lost. It's like once I was beautiful, once I mm-hmm. had this. Um, and then when she sings it again, we have Jemima standing up and sort of like listing all the things that were good in her life. And I think that's the moment when she realizes that her happiness wasn't all the things she lost. It was being part of the tribe, being part of the family, um, being part of these many generations of cats, which is also in the moments of happiness. And I think this is why Gus is not the choice. Um, I know he's the popular answer. But his song is all about how everything was much better in the past. It's, he was once this great actor. He did all these amazing things. But these kids these days, you know, they're all terrible. They don't understand. So he has all this regret, but he doesn't have the hope that Grisabella has. He can't look back and see the happiness in those memories. He only sees things he's lost. And I think that's the difference between the two of them. Yeah, I, it's, it's such a fascinating theory because, and you know, probably a lot of truth to it with the main song being memory mm-hmm. being about memories and then being able to kind of take each character's song and say this is where that comes from and like are they looking back or looking forward and is the only one that does a little bit of both like looks back at first and looks forward um yeah and, and i do think that that is probably the best argument for grisabella i've heard and i love the the telepathic like we've got we, we know it's coming because I've got all these cats that are going to let me know because I hadn't thought about it from that angle. That does change a few old Deuteronomies I've talked to who have said, I hadn't made my decision until Grisabella came back. So there are some <laughs> cats that played it differently than that, but I really like that as a thought of like, oh, he knows she's coming back because they're, you know, he's got the twins to so tell him. Yeah, and maybe there would be another cat who has, you know, fulfilled the very difficult task of figuring out what the meaning of happiness is. But I think Grisabella is the main one on that journey. Because, I mean, maybe his criteria is different every year. And it's, you know, I don't necessarily think that's a good criteria for choosing someone who gets to live again. I mean, maybe give it to the saddest person instead of, like, (laughs) the one who understands happiness. But I think that is the criteria. He's in charge, so it's his rule. Yeah, so that's the rule. He's picking by that. And because of that, she is the only choice or the logical choice. So yeah. you don't think, I guess my other argument that I've, that I've pushed hard on is that she is realizing that she misses her family, but then won't, like, doesn't get to come back to them, just gets immediately <laughs> offed before that. Like, why is that old Deuteronomy's choice then? Well, I don't know. I'm one of those people who likes to make sort of like an Irish goodbye from a party. Yeah. Like you're there, you're having fun, you're having a great time. You leave while the party is still good. You just, um, you don't sort of hang around until everyone's fed up of you all over again. Because, I mean, Grisabella might have figured out the meaning of happiness, but, you know, she probably still has all these issues with the various cats in the tribe. And if she was to hang around from a year, like she'd be happy, she'd be accepted again. But I just think you leave while the party's still good. So I think she's like this old sort of like glamorous actress. She has a sense of timing. She's gonna she's gonna go while it's still good and and before any sort of like awkward conversations can happen with the other cats, she she's out of there. She she's she's good. I think that's fun. I like it because I do love the the thought of her Irish exiting, but then she does an Irish exit. She she gets like the most grand everyone look at me, <laughs> I'm I'm out of here way out of the show <laughs> but i do i was like right when you said that i'm like oh that's great like i do like that a lot she just is like ah that's enough i've had enough i'm out um and you know we all have friends or are those people that have done that at the parties yeah well maybe that's the thing as well she's a diva so she's not going to hang around from a year and then just slip out sort of like in a year's time she wants to fly up on the tire and sort of like walk up the big metal cat pour just at the moment of maximum drama and it's not going to be a year from now it's going to be now yeah it, there is a like they need to, it's an annual ball, but like they, if they could do this in a month, I think that's probably all she needs. Like give her a month <laughs> also, with the family. Also, cats don't live that long, so yeah, maybe a month we have another ball. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Oh, I, I don't know. We've had my family's had some cats live a long time, so oh really? Oh yeah, yeah like 17, 18 years uh, oh, wow. for okay. cats. Yeah, I'm a dog person, <clears throat> and and dogs, which is weird. Dogs don't, but cats. Uh, there no. are some that are that will go for for a long time. That was actually one of my husband's takeaways when I forced him to see Cats was um, he was like, it's really weird you're a dog person and you love this show. But now that I've seen it, most of the songs are about how annoying cats are. So I guess. <laughs> I, you know, I don't, as a also a dog person, grew up with both animals. Um, 
I, I don't feel like that that has anything to do with with the show. I think the show no. is so different, and like they could have made. The, I don't think it would have worked with dogs just in general. But no. um, but I feel like the novelty of it stems a lot from the animal choice, and you don't have to be a fan of the animal to be a fan of like the absurdity of the musical. Well, absolutely not, because they're not cats. They're people. They're, they're cat people. <laughs> they're yeah. They're cats embracing, or they're humans embracing their cats. Yes. Um, I, this has been super fun. What else? Um, before we close here, what else? Is there anything else that we didn't cover today that you were like, oh, I, I definitely, in, the, in a cat's podcast, this needs to get brought up? I guess one of the main things that doesn't get talked about so much is, um, it's not a fan theory, it's just how great the, the makeup and the costumes are. Um, and a, another sort of John Napier design and kind of how punk the show was when it started. Because, you know, Android Lloyd Webber, he'd had, he'd had a bit of success up until mm-hmm. then but he wasn't like the mega musical guy he kind of nobody wanted to back the show he was actually asking the original actors to buy shares in the show because they couldn't afford to put it on and a lot of that early design is is really based around sort of london fashion of the time so you have the vivian westwood influences with like spiky mm. collars and the makeup is very new romantic um, and it really had that kind of like punk sort of vibe to it. Um, nobody knew it would be such a smash hit. And I think that's the thing that gets forgotten now that it is like the mega musical that's the butt of every joke about yeah. how bad Broadway is. It kind of started off as this really out there sort of arty show. And um, and it doesn't, like I said, it doesn't hold you by the hand and tell you what's happening. It wants you to engage with the dance. The story is told through dance, through lighting, through the tone of the music. Um Everyone now thinks of it as like a tourist show, um, you know, that anyone can go and see because it's this dumb thing about cats. But I really don't think that's true. I, I kind of think it asks you to engage with like the artistry of it if you're going to enjoy it. Maybe it's why a lot of people don't enjoy it. But I, I really just do think that gets forgotten how sort of out there it was when it, it first came about. Yeah, I, the the set design, the costumes, the whole like experience is next level and i do think that that's why i think the reason it is so why like it's recommended as a tourist show is because you don't really need to know anything to go in and still experience it there's probably some cat that is relevant to your life that you could pull from and it's just strange enough i mean it's extremely strange but it's just strange (laughs) enough but also like extremely you know you're gonna know one song you're gonna see some really incredible dancing that there's i've been to plenty of shows where um being in new york now i get i get access to a lot more and so i've been to other shows where i'm like that was great performing but like that is not my cup of tea like that was just not for me and i don't think that there's like that many because nobody can give me a thoughtful reason why they dislike cats maybe your husband with your husband being like it's because one jumped (laughs) in my lap and that's why i dislike it (laughs) but most people are just like they just didn't get it and it's like yeah i mean me me too and i'm almost 100 episodes (laughs) in on this of not getting it so i do think it's why it works is because it just has such a wide range of like it's theater and you're gonna get dance you're gonna get song you're gonna get really cool set design and costumes and something unique whereas some of these other shows i'm not gonna throw anything under the bus it's like very much a you're either gonna love this comedy or you're gonna hate this comedy or you're gonna love Mm -hmm. this style of like there's a lot of these like big old timey musicals like that's a style and some people really don't like those that style and i just don't feel that with cats i think that's why it does land so well for so many different people and why it's still going Exactly, and I think it's quite an easy show to be snobby about because it was such a phenomenon. And it's it's out of fashion somewhat now. I think it's coming back around again, yeah. you know, movie notwithstanding. But I, I think a lot of shows nowadays are like you know Disney shows or jukebox musicals. So you go into that show and you already know the show. You know what happened in the film. You know all the songs. And with Cats, it was back then just like going into this completely alien world where the story's told through dance, it's completely sung through, and you have to meet it on its terms. And that was a really specific style of theater, which, you know, a lot of people might say, oh, you know, the mainstream audience just can't, can't like, can't appreciate, but they did. Yeah. And I, I think there's this instinct to dumb down, but you don't have to because I think people can go and see a show like Cats that's really arty and they can enjoy it. And I think often we assume that 
that kind of show can't reach anyone nowadays. And I'd love to see a show like Cats where it's just unapologetically weird on Broadway now instead of something really familiar. Yeah, and I mean, it's it's the current wave is all the movie musicals and like all these mm. other things where it's stuff that you at least have some idea of the source material um, or revivals and other stuff. And there isn't as much new. And I think that there's a lot of people talking about that and how to get more yeah. new, like, creative uh stuff out there and absolutely i hope it does i you know there's there's a world for some weird stuff out there to to make its way to to broadway yeah absolutely well this has been so fun um how can people stay in touch with your art and you and find stuff that you you make and all the cats related stuff you do so my main place for my cat stuff is my Instagram, which is Emperor Rainbow. Emperor, like the guy who rules stuff, Rainbow, <laughs> like the big colorful thing in the sky. Awesome. Awesome. And um, and I know you said you're doing some writing and you, you also do some yeah, art. Yeah, that's and- right. Yeah, I write for a website called We Are The Mutants. Um, they have a book coming out very soon um, and it's Cold War era pop culture in, in, in a kind of like skewed view of it um so if you like cats if you like sort of 80s pop culture you'll really like that website amazing well thank you so much for for coming on today thank you for having me this was great i got to talk about cats for like an hour which i never get yeah. to do <laughs> with someone who listens versus someone like i can only yeah, imagine your husband's like all right enough enough of this absolutely yes amazing <laughs> well thank you and thanks everyone else to listen to this episode of the wrong cat die the podcast breakdown of the cat catastrophe to follow along you can subscribe on apple Podcasts, spotify stitcher or, whatever, or anywhere else you listen to podcasts follow us on twitter instagram and tiktok at the wrong cat died or check out our website the wrong cat died.com. Yeah.